Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the video that I have for you all today is one that is a very tragic case that happened over a year ago, but just recently there have been a few new developments. So I think we're starting to find out a lot more about what exactly happened, but we still don't know the full story. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody thinks about this case after hearing all of the details. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Raycon. Raycon offers products that deliver premium audio at the perfect price point so you can build new habits without breaking the bank. Whether you're looking for a new pair of everyday earbuds or low latency gaming headphones or a speaker with a battery that will last you all night at your next get together, Raycon has got you covered. And they start at half the price point of other premium audio brands. So whether you need a new pair of everyday earbuds with a spare pair to keep in your car if you ever forget your main pair, or if you need earbuds and a speaker, you can get more than one product and still pay less than you would with other brands. Brands. I personally love my Raycons for working out and listening to music and listening to podcasts while I'm doing cardio at the gym or doing tours around the house. I also love that Raycons are so comfortable to wear. They are intelligently designed so that they seamlessly fit into the curvature of the human ear no matter what size ear you have. They don't hurt even after wearing them for extended periods of time and they do not fall out no matter what you're doing, whether you're running, jumping, or doing a workout at the gym. I also really like their noise isolation versus awareness modes. The noise isolation feature allows you to be totally immersed in your music and block outside noise, which is nice when I really want to be dialed in while I'm doing cardio on a stair stepper at the gym or something like that, but they also have the awareness mode for when I'm listening to something on the go. For example, as I'm walking through the park, parking lot at the store, I want to make sure that I'm aware of my surroundings at all times, so awareness mode allows me to listen to my podcasts while also being aware of what's going on around me. I know that you will love your Raycons as much as I love mine, but Raycon wants you to feel good about your purchase too. So they offer buy now, pay later options, as well as easy and free returns guaranteed. So if you want to buy something small that will offer a big impact, make sure you click the link in my description box below or head to buyraycon.com slash Rachel Shannon to get 15% off of your Raycon purchase. That's buyraycon.com slash Rachel Shannon for 15% off of your purchase. Thank you again so much to Raycon for partnering with me on today's video. With all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the tragic death of Jared Bridegin. Jared Bridegin was born on June 29th, 1988 in Warrensburg, Missouri to his parents Gaylord and Joanne Bridegin. When he was young, Jared moved with his family when he was young, Jared moved with his family to Jacksonville, Florida, and from there, he graduated from the Douglas Anderson School of Arts in 2007. Then he went on to attend Utah Valley University, graduating in 2014 with his bachelor's degree in digital media with an emphasis on cinema production. Jared was known to be a man of faith, being a part of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. He enjoyed working on home projects with his second wife, Kristen. Together, they worked on several projects, including making handcrafted wooden beams for the master ceiling, building a custom fireplace and an office desk, and shiplapped walls, and more. He was known to be happy-go-lucky and a bit shy around those he didn't know, but those close to him describe that he was a powerful presence in their lives. His sister said that he was someone who was known around the neighborhood and his job as someone who loved his family and was always willing to help others. She said, quote, My brother was the one that the entire neighborhood went to for tools to help with projects around the home, and they absolutely loved him. He was the first one to serve. Anyone could go to him for help with projects or to fix things, and he dropped everything to help them. Jared also taught Sunday school to 11 and 12 year old children within the LDS church. Those who he taught described that he was fun to be around. He had creative lessons with funny stories to go along with them, all as he taught the children about their Lord and Savior. Jared enjoyed videography, working in several senior positions with different companies until he ended up as a senior design manager at Microsoft. By 2009, Jared was back in Florida where he met a woman named Shanna Gardner. 
Shanna was actually from Utah and she too was a part of the LDS church but she was only in Florida visiting a friend when she met Jared. Like I said, Shanna is from a Mormon family and her parents co-founded the company Stampin' Up, which is an arts and crafts company, and apparently she came from a lot of money. Some sources state that the company grosses around $100 million per year. It was also stated that Shanna would often boast about the luxurious lifestyle that she could offer Jared when she first met him. She talked about how they could go wherever they wanted, fly anywhere in the world, and her parents would pay for everything. After meeting, the two quickly started a relationship, and by 2010, the two moved to Shanna's home base in Utah, buying their first home for $800,000. Then the two were married that same year in 2010, and soon after that, the couple moved to Connecticut. During this time, the couple gave birth to a set of twins, Abby and Liam. Also during this time, neither Shanna nor Jared were working, though Shanna's parents gave Jared some money to start up his own business. According to some sources, it was during their time living in Connecticut that the relationship between Shanna and Jared started to go downhill. Shanna stopped going to church and it was said that she started working out obsessively. Jared, on the other hand, he was starting to gain a little bit of weight and was spending a lot of time working and trying to get his business off of the ground. After having twins by 2015, the couple then moved back to Jared's home base in Florida because I guess Liam has a heart condition where it was better for him to live at sea level. Once there, the two bought another house for $800,000 in Point Verda Beach, just south of Jacksonville. And here, things grew even worse for the couple. Once again, Jared continued attending church, but Shanna started growing away from the LDS church. She joined CrossFit and was also trying to get Jared to go to the gym as well and bought him personal training sessions as gifts. But some sources state that while she was at this gym, Shanna started an affair with her personal trainer. She does deny this to this day, but according to some, Jared found emails between the two on Shanna's personal computer and that is when he confronted her about it. And again, according to sources, that is when Shanna told Jared that she didn't love him anymore. So by February of 2015, Shanna filed for divorce, thus starting a long tumultuous battle for child support and other parenting conflicts. Initially, Shanna filed for full custody of the twins as well as sole occupancy of the home. She also accused Jared of several things, such as threatening to take cash from the children's trust funds and using it for himself. She also said that he would coach the children to say awful things about her and then record them and then would threaten to use these recordings in court. But Jared said that he was the one who deserved full custody of the children. He also said that he deserves alimony and child support as well as sole occupancy of the home since Shanna had better means to relocate. He too accused Shanna of abusive behavior. He said that she would hide baby monitors in the children's bedrooms to spy on him, placing one under Abby's dresser and then another under Liam's bed. He also accused her of placing a tracking device on his car. He also said that there were several times that Shanna would lock him out of their master bedroom and she would degrade him in front of their children. He also accused Shanna of canceling an appointment for heart surgery that Liam needed that they had been waiting months for. He said that even though he tried to fight for their marriage before, her canceling this appointment was the final straw for him. In the divorce proceedings, Jared wrote to his lawyer, quote, This is enough. I should have every damn right on my own property to not be under constant recording or monitoring by Shanna. I want the flipping gates of hell released on her for this. After all of this back and forth, the court did ultimately decide on shared custody, with switching the children back and forth between their homes every other week, with a parent getting a date night every Wednesday on their week off. But even after this was decided, over the following six years, they continued fighting over the children. Despite all of this trouble, during this time, Jared started working again as a designer for a software engineering company based out of Utah. Also during this time is when he met a new woman named Kristen. The two met on a dating app while she was living in North Carolina and working for Microsoft. 
It was said that Jared had been dating around for a bit, but he never really connected with anybody until he met Kristen. For their first date, he actually drove six hours to North Carolina to meet her. After that, a few months later, Kristen requested that her job move to being fully remote. Then she moved with him to Florida, and by 2017, the two got married. A year later, they went on to have two more children, Brexley, who was born in August of 2019, and then London, who was born in August of 2021. At the same time, Shanna also went on to get remarried to a man named Mario in 2018, who we will discuss a little bit more later in the video. Those who knew Jared said that the marriage between him and Kristen was amazing. Jared lived his life to serve his wife and his children. He loved being her husband and a father to his four children. He built the children a playhouse for the backyard as well as a laser tag arena in the garage. He just seemed to have an endless amount of energy for spending time and creating memories with his children. But once again, the fights between Jared and Shanna never stopped. By 2019, Shanna demanded that the courts open an investigation into the accusations that she was making against Jared of coaching their children to say bad things about her, which she said was an example of emotional abuse, but this demand was denied. Then, by June of 2021, Shanna told the court that Jared was not allowing her to borrow a breathing machine that she needed for her son, unless she apologized to Jared for her behavior. This was basically an oxygen machine that he would need if he was traveling above sea level. I guess Jared had a smaller machine that was more convenient for traveling, while Shanna had a much larger machine that was more difficult to travel with. She filed a motion in court because of this with her lawyer stating, quote, the father apparently considers his vindictiveness towards the mother more important than protecting his son's health and life. They went on to write, he is more concerned with humiliating the mother than he is of making sure his own child does not die. Due to this, the court had Jared pay Shanna back the money that she had spent with Jared to buy this machine. I guess they went in on buying this machine together, but it seemed that Jared invested a lot more money than Shanna did, so he was awarded ownership of this device in late 2021. By the evening of February 16th, 2022, 33-year-old Jared left the house at around 5.50 p.m. to pick up the 10-year-old twins for their Wednesday date night, taking two-year-old Brexley with him while the baby, London, stayed at home with Kristen. He then picks them up and they all go out to dinner and get ice cream together. By around 7.45 p.m., he dropped Abby and Liam back off at Shanna's. Then by 7.47 p.m., he called Kristen and the two spoke briefly for only about a minute or two as he heads home to where he lives in St. Augustine with, of course, Brexley coming with him. However, as he was driving, he noticed a tire in the middle of the very narrow one-way road near the exit of the neighborhood. This tire was blocking the road, so he wasn't able to just swerve around it. So Jared put his hazards on and then pulled over. And then Jared got out of the car to move the tire out of the way to continue driving. But as he was doing so, all of a sudden, he was ambushed. He was shot four times at close range, and he died immediately. A few minutes later, a passerby noticed Jared lying in the street after being shot. Then they noticed that there was a two-year-old little girl still strapped into the car seat in the car. Luckily, Brexley was not harmed. But immediately, this passerby did call 911 to report that there had been a shooting. Now, going back just a bit, Kristen had been expecting Jared to get home at around 8.15 p.m. since Shanna's house was only about a half hour drive away. But when 8.30 came, she started to worry. Like I said earlier, she had just spoken with Jared who told her that he was on his way home. So at that point, she went outside and started looking around to see if he would drive up or if maybe there were emergency vehicles because maybe he got into an accident or something like that. By 8.46 p.m., Kristen started to panic with no sign of Jared anywhere. She had been calling and texting Jared over and over and over again, but she was getting no response. So she finally got into the car and started heading towards Shanna's house to see what was going on. 
As she was driving, she continued calling Jared until finally one of the calls were answered, but it was not her husband who answered. It was a police officer who told her to go to the Jacksonville Beach Police Station, which she did. When she got there, police weren't telling her really much of anything. All they really told her was that Brexley was okay. And as soon as she got there, she was taken into a break room by another officer. In the break room, Brexley was sitting at the table wrapped in a blanket and was coloring a coloring book. Finally, after several minutes of begging the police for answers about what had happened, finally, an officer told her that her husband had just been killed. So, after finding out that her husband was murdered, obviously, Shanna, Jared's ex-wife, was the next to be informed. She reported that she found out in the middle of the night and when she was notified, she fell to the floor. She said she was just in complete shock. She was horrified. She didn't believe it, and it just didn't feel real to her. After the two women found out, the next step, obviously, was to inform the children. Kristen had asked Shanna if she could be present when the children were notified about Jared's death since she was their stepmother and she was a big part of their life, too, and Shanna agreed. They went over to Shanna's house on February 18th, two days after the murder, of course, the twins were horrified and shocked from all of this. I can't even imagine finding out that your father has died by being murdered when you're only 10 years old. After this, Shanna said that she gave them a yes day where, you know, basically they can do whatever they want that entire day. I guess there was a drum set that Liam had been wanting, so they went to the store and got that, and they just sort of did a day that was dedicated to the children after this. But in the days after the murder, there were several things that happened that really bothered Kristen. First of all, only 12 days after the murder, Shanna was texting Kristen and was asking her for the death certificate. She was absolutely shocked by this since not only was it so soon, but there she was trying to plan a funeral for her husband and it seemed that Shanna was only interested in getting the death certificate for whatever reason. Most likely, in my opinion, for maybe insurance money for her children since some of the money was probably going to the twins, but that is just my speculation. But also after Jared's death, she did hire a defense attorney, which that in and of itself, I don't think is totally odd. After covering true crime for all of this time, I think that it's very smart that if someone very close to you is killed, and especially if you're being spoken to by the police, you know, no matter how it may make you look to outsiders, I do always suggest hiring an attorney. But beyond that, Shanna said that she hired the attorney because she was afraid that the children were going to be blasted by the media. She was afraid of all of the attention that her family was going to be getting. Yet, after that was said, Shanna's mom proceeded to post pictures of her grandchildren everywhere. She wrote on her blog and she was not shy about having an online presence or blasting pictures of the twins everywhere. This was something that just did not make sense to Kristen because if your reason for hiring a defense attorney is the fact that you're worried about what the media is going to say about you and the children, yet your mother is sitting here posting a bunch of pictures of the children to social media and writing about it on her blog, that just does not make sense. Then it came time for Jared's funeral, which took place on March 3rd. So, Shanna got a lot of flack because neither her nor the twins attended the funeral. However, Shanna's mother came out to say that Kristen told Shanna that she and anybody that she knew were not invited to the funeral. But Kristen said that she did want the twins to be there. So, she asked Shanna if she could pick up the twins and bring them to the funeral, but Shanna refused to let them go unless Shanna could go. But that did not happen. She didn't go to the funeral and neither did the twins. So Shanna and her mother said that they decided to do a private memorial service for Jared with the twins herself. After this, Kristen said that she attempted to get into contact with Shanna so that she could talk to her stepchildren, but Shanna would not respond until late March, so an entire month to which Shanna agreed that the children were allowed to FaceTime Kristen one time per week for Braxley to talk to the twins. 
but this only lasted for three weeks when Shanna stopped responding and did not let the twins speak to their half-siblings anymore. Then there was a candlelight vigil held for Jared on April 19th to which Shanna was invited. Anyone and everyone was allowed to come to just pay respects for Jared and to try to find justice for who did this to him, but Shanna did not show up to this and neither did the twins. After that, communication almost completely stopped between Shanna and Kristen and between the children. In the aftermath, Kristen talked about how she is left to just take care of her two young children all by herself. The kids were way too young to understand what happened to their father, so they're just left with a situation where their dad just stopped being around and they have no idea why. It's just horrible. So, for the months after the murder, of course, the family and police did all that they could to search for who was responsible for murdering Jared. So, for the months after, of course, the family and police all did what they could to search for who was responsible for this crime. Police announced that they believed that this shooting was an ambush because of how it all went down. The fact that the tire was in the road, which caused Jared to have to stop and get out of his car to move it. Then, as soon as he's out of the car, he's murdered. It is not a coincidence, and it's clear that this was planned. Immediately, police went to the public to ask for help in identifying a dark blue Ford F-150 pickup truck with brown or tan trim and running boards that was manufactured sometime between 2004 and 2008. Shanna also did not speak to the media or release many statements during that time. She said that she was advised not to speak with the media about anything relating to this case, so she said she did just that. She said that while, yes, they did have a tumultuous divorce, there were happy moments. She said that she still feels very blessed that he gave her two beautiful children who she loves. She said that she is devastated over the entire situation. For months, that is all we knew. Police weren't releasing anything, and really, we didn't have a lot of information to go off of. However, by January 25th of 2023, police have finally arrested and named a suspect in this case. 61-year-old Henry Arthur Tenen was arrested with charges of conspiracy to commit murder, second-degree murder with a weapon, accessory after the fact, and child abuse. The child abuse charge is in relation to the fact that the two-year-old was obviously still in the car when this took place, so her life was in danger when her father was being murdered. So, let's talk a bit about Henry Tenen. Henry Tenen was born in 1961 in Hawksville, Georgia. He went to Vian High School and went on to study at Middle Georgia Technical College. We don't know exactly when or why he moved to Jacksonville, but I believe he was there since around 1991. After that, not a ton is known about him or his exact involvement in this crime because the arrest affidavit has not been released. It's been sealed for now but we do know that he does have a criminal record. I'm going to read directly from an article that lists all of his criminal history, to which all took place in Jacksonville, dating back to 1998. In 1998, he was charged with driving with a license that is suspended or revoked. 1999, trespassing in an occupied structure, battery and criminal mischief, 200 to 1000 dollars in damage and for this he pled no contest and he was sentenced to 25 days in jail in 2000 he was charged with operating a motor vehicle with a suspended license as a habitual traffic offender by 2002 he was charged with writing a worthless check that obtained property less than 150 dollars he pled guilty to this and he was sentenced to two days in jail. In 2003, he was charged once again with operating a motor vehicle with a suspended license as a habitual traffic offender. In 2003, he was charged with domestic battery, to which he pleaded no contest, and he was sentenced to one day in jail and 12 months of probation. By 2008, he was charged with operating a motor vehicle with a suspended license and leaving the scene of an accident with property damage, which is very annoying. I, that drives me crazy, people driving around with no insurance and no license, and they're just like, hitting people and recklessly driving, I do not understand that whatsoever. 
but by 2013, he was charged with domestic battery for hitting his girlfriend several times in the face. To this, he pleaded no contest, and he was sentenced to 60 days in jail and 12 months of probation. The girlfriend filed an injunction for protection against him at that time. In 2016, once again, he was charged with driving with a suspended license and careless driving. August 13th, 2022, he was also charged with leaving the scene of an accident with property damage. Then, in 2013 and 2014, back in Georgia, he got two DUIs. So, obviously, this is very annoying, this kind of criminal history. I just had a recent experience with my boyfriend who just got hit by an uninsured driver, of course, and now that person can't pay for any of the damages that they caused. It drives me crazy when people do things like that, when people are driving around with a suspended license and not only do they not have insurance and they're driving around without a license, but they're also causing accidents. You would think that people that don't have those things that are not trying to get caught for not having a license would drive more carefully so they don't get pulled over, but it seems that these people with no license and no insurance are just causing accidents. I know that's a generalization, but like, it drives me insane. It drives me just insane. Either way, let's pause on Henry and go back and talk a bit more about Shanna and Mario and how all of this ties together. So, I want to mention that as the divorce was happening back in 2015 with Shanna and Jared, she allegedly said to someone at work that things would be better if Jared would just shut up and she wanted to find a way to shut him up, though Shanna denied that she ever said that, but the coworker says that she did. So, we don't know 100%. Then, around the same time, those around her noticed that her behavior was shifting a lot. As I stated, she was from a Mormon family. She always had her head on very straight, going down a very normal, straight, narrow path. However, along with her stopping attending church, which, you know, people do all the time, she allegedly had this affair and she also started getting tattoos and she also got a clitoral piercing. For most people, this isn't something that's crazy or weird or anything like that. I have a few tattoos myself. I plan on getting many more. But for her, many people around her said that this just was not like her. Again, she was also exercising obsessively. She was doing all of these things that were completely out of character for her. She was allegedly, you know, recording Jared and she was putting a tracking device on his car. All of these things were just very abnormal behaviors for her. Then, there are rumors around Mario and his past behavior of violence. So, like I mentioned earlier, Mario and Shanna were married in 2018, and just before that, the two moved into a neighborhood in the Jacksonville Beach area. In that community, there was a black and white cat named Apollo, who was just this little stray cat who was known and loved around the community. However, just a few weeks after Mario and Shanna moved there, the cat was shot and killed with a BB gun. After this cat was found deceased, there was a neighbor who was just heartbroken about the entire thing, and he told Mario about the cat's passing, and instead of showing empathy or asking questions, Mario just responded with saying how much he hated cats. So, people think that based on his behaviors around this, that he may have been the one responsible for killing this cat with a BB gun. Now, he has never been convicted of this or arrested for this, for that matter, but it's just something to note. It's a rumor. It's nothing more than that. As far as I know, Mario doesn't have any other past criminal history, and he's never been named as a suspect this far in Jared's death. So, that is just something I wanted to know about Mario that we know or maybe, you know, don't know if it's just a rumor, but a lot of people think that it was him, so I'll just leave it at that. Either way, it turned out that Mario bought and rented properties around Florida. Well, it turned out that Henry Tennant was actually a tenant who rented from Mario. So, that is the connection that people have made between Jared's death and this man who is now arrested for it knowing Jared's 
ex-wife and her current husband. Then, just this last month in January, right before the arrest of Henry was announced, Shanna and the twins uprooted their entire lives in Florida and moved clear across the country to Washington, literally as far as you could possibly move from Florida, which is just crazy. So those are the connections that we know as of right now. As I've stated, the arrest affidavit for Henry has not yet been released and the police have not made any comments on these connections, nor has Shanna. She also declined to comment about the arrest of Henry or about her move or about anything else in this case. I also do want to mention that neither Shanna or Mario have been named as persons of interest or arrested in this case. Now, with that being said, police have said that this ambush was done by somebody who did not act alone, i.e. Henry did not act alone in allegedly murdering Jared. We also see that Henry was charged with second-degree murder, not first-degree murder, when police said that this was a planned ambush. This was planned ahead of time, so that would constitute first-degree murder. So, the fact that he wasn't arrested or charged with that says that there must be other people involved who had the aspect of first-degree murder on their end. So, clearly, as you probably have gathered, we have this connection between Henry and Shanna, but there is no known connection between Henry and Jared. Therefore, no reason for Henry to want to go out and murder Jared independent of knowing her, his ex-wife and her new husband. That paired with the fact that Henry most likely did not act alone based on what the police have said, there is an assumption that somehow Shanna or Mario or both are connected to Jared's death. So now we are on to the theories in this case, and as I want to state, these are solely my opinions. They are my own thoughts. None of this is confirmed or fact. It is all alleged and it is all theorized. I think the obvious situation here, though, is that for whatever reason, Jared was killed as a result of Shanna or Mario somehow getting Henry to do it. We know, obviously, that they had this very messy divorce and custody battle. We know that Shanna was starting to act different around the time of the divorce. We know that she was acting out towards the family and whatever reason, she was keeping the twins from their stepmother and their step-siblings. Clearly, in my opinion, she was not doing what was best for her children. She was doing what was best for her in that situation. We know from all accounts during this time that Jared was a happy man. He was loved by his coworkers. His friends, family, and coworkers and neighbors all said that all he ever did was talk about his children, how much he loved his wife, how much he loved doing home projects with Kristen and spending time with his kids. It seemed that, yes, he was not happy with Shanna. He was clearly giving Shanna back everything that she was giving to him in terms of the custody battles and all of that. But clearly, it seems that even after his death, she just continued on with this whole thing of keeping the kids away and making life as hard as possible for them and Kristen. I just know that any mother or most mothers would want their kids to have as much time as possible, at least with their half-siblings, after their father suddenly dies. Moms would want them to have their stepmom in their lives since she was the one who loved and cared for them for so many years, even though she wasn't biologically related to them and she birthed their siblings. But that doesn't seem to be what Shanna wanted. She kept the twins away from their siblings. She moved them across the country. She refuses to even let them call their stepmother and their siblings, let alone visit them. That is just not a good look for her at all. In my opinion, I think that if Shanna truly was grieving and she truly was just trying to get her children through this situation and was trying to give them the best life possible and was helping them cope and was helping them through this devastating murder of their father, she would want them to be close with everybody who cared about them. And that includes Kristen. That includes their half-siblings. They clearly loved their half-siblings. They clearly loved these little kids and loved spending time with them. And Kristen wanted to make sure that her two young children would still get to see their siblings, but Shanna was not having that. In my opinion, 
Kristen is how a mother would act when their father is dead and when they're taken away from them. Kristen still wanted her children to have contact with Shanna and with their half-siblings, with the twins, but Shanna did not want any of that for whatever reason. For whatever reason, she wanted to cut Jared off, she wanted to cut the twins off from that aspect of their lives, and it doesn't seem like that's the best way to help your grieving children through losing their father. That's just my opinion and I think that's an opinion a lot of people hold because again, I just do not think that Shanna's behavior is normal for somebody who has lost someone that she once loved. Yes, they had a tumultuous relationship. Yes, they were fighting a lot but even if someone that I wasn't on good terms with, if they died and I shared anything with them like a pet or even children for that matter especially children or anything that we shared together at one point I would still be upset I would still want to get this person that I have mutually with them even if I had a mutual friend who lost this person who I no longer had contact with I would still want to support them as much as possible yet that doesn't seem to be what Shanna wants to do. So that is all I'm going to say about this case. You guys know my opinions as I've stated them, but obviously I want to know what you guys think. I want you all to comment what you think is going on here. Do you think that Shanna is involved? Do you think that Mario did something that Shanna has no idea about? Do you think that both of them are in on this together? Or do you think something else is going on completely? Let's discuss your thoughts and theories in the comments below. But with that, if you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.